just thinking about uh, family gatherings and just how, um, how fun they can be. But um, the term came to my mind, one big happy family. And I think anytime we get together, that's what we want, isn't it? Is just everybody to get along, one big happy family and just enjoying the time together. And oftentimes it does happen and then, and then there's times when it's, it's not happening, there's a conflict. But as I thought more about that, do you know your, the promise of, of your eternal life in heaven there's one big happy family up there and there's no sin anymore. That's going to be the best reunion of all, right? One big happy family. In the meantime, we get a glimpse here of one big happy family that, that God's intent is for us to be that encouragement one for another that when we come together, that an oasis, that time to... Uh, reflect and to hear about each other's journey during the week and then uh, be built up to go out and serve the Lord uh, throughout the week. But one big happy family, a glimpse of heaven where everybody gets along. And you know, it is amazing because when you come here, um, you really are on your best behavior. So thank you for being on your best behavior when you come here. Uh, I know some of you may have had uh, some things in the car when you were coming and little Junior was not sitting on his side, all that. And then you, you come here and no, no behave. So, so in that, God has been working in you to um, really, um, it's part of the making of the family of God. You've been in training to be part of a family part of the family of God, not just here at Evergreen, but wherever you go, there's this, the Holy Spirit in you is the making of this connection with different um, people um, that believe in Jesus, and you get to connect to them at different places. Maybe at work, you know somebody that knows Jesus, and there's this family connection, and you nurture that family connection. And so wherever you are, there is this desire to be family, and, and to be loving and kind. And, and so, last week we were coming through um, Acts chapter 4, and there's something ho- Holy Spirit that happened, just amazing uh, happening, is when the Holy Spirit uh, poured out, there was, um, the disciples began speaking Jesus' name boldly, They weren't embarrassed. They weren't afraid. Jesus had just been crucified. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were speaking with boldness the name of Jesus. And even Peter and John said, whom you crucified, (laughs) no fear. Is that amazing? That when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there is no fear. There's, but speaking, the reason why you live and breathe is because the Father sent the Son to, to give you new life. And so you're operating in that new life, the Holy Spirit in you. And so uh, as they spoke the name we looked at last week, the name of Jesus, they were warned by the leadership of Israel, the religious people, don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And so they threatened them. So they came and reported back um, to their friends and their family about what had happened. And... Uh, and they began praying all together. They began rejoicing. So the first thing they did, and we talked about this last week, they acknowledged God in the praise of creation. So we talked about you and I, that needs to be, we're commanded to praise God, but it needs to be our response in any situation to begin praising God and recognizing how powerful he is and that we're a part of this creation and this plan that he has made. And so we talked a little bit about this morning that we're commanded to do that. that. That wards off a lot of stuff when we begin praising him. The better we are at praising God and thanking him and acknowledging who he is. So that's what they did. They immediately filled with the spirit. They began praising God. And then they acknowledged God in the signs of the times. They, they acknowledged the prophecy coming real that it was Jesus Christ whom David was talking about in the Psalms. So they acknowledged God, they acknowledged his sovereignty. 
that God is in control of all things, even through suffering. God was in control of Christ being tormented and suffering and dying on the cross and then coming back to life again, that that was God's plan. And so we recognize even God's sovereignty in the suffering that we go through. So the third thing they did was they prayed and they recognized their participation in God's plan and they prayed that they would speak boldly the name of Jesus and that through them healing would happen through them in the name of Jesus. And then, so if you open up your scriptures to Acts chapter 4, verse 31, God was so pleased (laughs) with their prayer, God was so pleased with them He acknowledged what they were saying because they were praying exactly what he wanted. In verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together shook. God did that. The place where they were gathered, God acknowledged their prayer for boldness in sharing the name of Jesus. And the whole place shook And then it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So one more time, the Holy Spirit came upon them like at Pentecost and they began going everywhere, speaking boldly the name of Jesus. Evidence of the Holy Spirit in you and me, we're not ashamed of Jesus. Evidence of allowing the Spirit to work through us and, say, and praying, Lord, fill me with boldness. Fill me with boldness to speak your name. Lord, fill me with that place that I can bring healing to people. So, our passage then today, we're going to go from 32 through 37. And I call verse 32 the impossible love. The impossible love. What is happening to them, what's recorded in Scripture, has never happened before. What came out of them had never happened before. This was the power of God's pleasure, the Holy Spirit pouring out on them. So it says this, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, one soul, Neither did anyone say that any one of the things he possessed was his own, but they all had all things in common. Impossible love. To all of a sudden, instead of this is mine and you can't have it, to sure, let's share it. (laughs) One of the first things that mom and dad have to teach their kids because every kid is born in sin wanting their own way. You never have to teach a kid to be selfish, right? That the Holy Spirit on this group of people, instead of going, it's mine, they went, oh, I don't know what's happening to me, but why don't I share this with you? (laughs) So parents are constantly teaching their kids, no, share with your sister. That's what God wants. So the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden they're going, no, what, what's mine is yours. Let's, let's share with the... This was impossible. You imagine that? This is impossible. We all have our stuff. Don't you touch my guitar. No, just kidding. But impossible love means I want to share with you. Sharing an impossible thing. Impossible love. And yet the Holy Spirit was doing that in such a way they were, they were giving things to each other and they were making sure that people had what they needed. Isn't that beautiful? So every time you and I have that urge and we begin doing that, evidence of the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, it's selfishness. So you're being trained by the Holy Spirit to be unselfish and, and giving and It's an amazing thing, a glimpse of that impossible love. So the first thing that it says here is it says, now the multitude of those who believed. So they believed what? Well, they believed in Jesus. They believed who he is. Uh, the, The Pharisees were constantly asking Jesus 
are you the son of God? And finally, Jesus would say, it is as you said, I'm the son of God. And then they wanted to kill him because they said, you are blaspheming. So son of God, um, the centurion at the foot of the cross, when the earth quaked and shook and the darkness came, he said, surely this was the son of God. So what I'd like to do is they, they believed all these people, the, the spirit came upon them because they believed in Jesus, who Jesus is and who Jesus said he was. And so what I'd like you to do is take a journey with me um, through the book of John. And we're just going to skip through it and see what did Jesus say about himself. So start out in John. So you're in Acts now. Just go back one book to the book of John. And let's just, let's just skip through this and see What did Jesus say? What do you believe about Jesus? Does it line up with what Jesus said here? So in John chapter 3, so get ready to just turn your pages. John chapter 3, Jesus said in verse 3, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Most assuredly, I'd say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You need a new birth. Um, Go then to verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son in the world, into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. What else did Jesus say? Jesus said to the woman at the well, verse 13 of chapter 4 of John, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Um, Let's go to John chapter 4, verse 23. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such worshipers to him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's go to John chapter uh, chapter 5, verse 24. John 5, 24. We're just making our way through seeing what did Jesus say about himself Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. John chapter 6, verse 35. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Go to verse 48. John six forty eight. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of of the world. This is Jesus verse 63. It is the spirit who gives life and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and there are they are life. John chapter 7 verse last part of verse 37, 737. On the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then the scripture says, But he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, 
and Jesus has not yet been glorified. Jesus is talking about life. Chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 8, verse 36, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Adam was, or Abraham was, I am. John chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. When he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Verse 37, Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. What did Jesus say about himself? Chapter 10, I am the door of the sheep. Verse, uh, chapter 10, verse um, 7. I'm the door of the sheep. And he says, verse 9, I'm the door. If anyone enters in by me, he shall be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not only, not, the, the thief comes not, okay, let me start. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never be snatched out of my hand. Chapter 11 of John, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this in John chapter 12 verse 35 a little while longer the light is with you walk while you have the light lest darkness overtake you he who walks in darkness does not know where he's going while you have the light believe in the light that you may become sons of light John chapter 14 verse 6 I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. John chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it will be done for you. By this, my Father will be glorified that you bear much fruit. Chapter 16 of John, verse 13. However, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all the truth, and he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you all things to come. Chapter 17, Jesus says this. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth and I've finished the work which you've given me to you. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory I had with you before the world was. We just took a journey through what did Jesus say about himself through the Gospel of John. If you are... Um, discipling anybody if there's a new believer that has come in 
and needs to be confirmed in who Jesus is, take him to the Gospel of John and start marching through. Need to know. So the first thing that we saw back in Acts chapter 32 is uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed, they believed in Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. They believed in him. And with one heart and soul. With one heart and soul. Isn't it amazing to think that the possibility of being with people that have the same heart and so the very core belief inside of them may be sitting right with you right now. That they believe in the same thing as you for life. Their decisions are based on believing in Jesus. That brings comfort to know that kind of security that the core belief of those that believe in Jesus are the same as yours. Perfection, not Christ. Only Christ was perfect. But that's the core belief. In where, so when, when you think about family together, this is huge to think of all the family reunions you've been to, that the ones that have that same core belief that you have, that you're, you're able to have security and you're able to um, rejoice and you're able to have the same mindset. Isn't that amazing? Because in, in all of our gatherings, there's those that are not converted yet. And there's only a certain amount of connection that we can have with them. But when you find others in that group with that same connection, you connect. Because it's that same core belief. And there's comfort in that, isn't that? There's comfort there knowing that they care about you. Knowing that Jesus said, here's the very center of my teaching. <clears throat> Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. <clears throat> And love your neighbor as yourself. When you, when you realize there's others that have that same love for God and concern for you, it's an amazing comfort, isn't it? That they believe in that teaching, that core teaching. That same comfort. So here was this group of people that came together. The Holy Spirit had given them a heart and soul. They had the same, same heart and soul, and so that's where that common, hey, I want to share, with, that's where the safety came in, and sharing with others is that they had the same heart and soul as the, pure, as the person next to them, and so they knew that it was going to come back, they knew it was one big happy family, because they, they were of the same mindset, and I think it's amazing that that's where the Holy Spirit brings us to, and so we find that comfort like they did right there, the Holy Spirit, and what was common among them. So there's something about us needing to fight for unity in, in the church of God, in people that have that same core teaching. Because the flesh in us says, you just hurt my feelings, so I'm going to take my truck and I'm going to go play in another sandbox. That's what we do. So here's an opportunity for us to fight for unity. And I appreciate Yvonne talking about when we are there at uh, the old settlers helping out there. We're not saying, Evergreen Church, that's the best church on the block. You need to, it's, here's a place where you can gather where there's family, you know? So fighting for unity. Um, Go to the book of Psalms and look up Psalm 133. And I've, uh, I've read this over and over again. And here's one you could memorize because it's only a few verses. But I've read this over and over again. But this last week, I spotted something right at the end. And I thought to myself, and maybe you've been there, why didn't I see this before? But here's God's heart over unity and over a big, happy family of God. Look at his heart. In 133, he says, Behold how good and pleasant it is 
for brethren to dwell together in unity. This is God's heart. This is what he wants to see from people that believe in Jesus. This is like the calling card for those that believe in Jesus is this unity and this love for one another. So he says, behold how pleasant, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And he says, it's like the, it's like the oil on the head running down the beard, the beard of Aaron. And he says, it's like the dew of Mount Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. And look what it says right at the end there. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. I missed that part. What does that got to do with unity? Do you know when it talks about Mount Zion, do you know that that was where Jesus was crucified? Do you know that that is Jerusalem? Do you, Mount Zion? When we get it, when we get it, he says that unity, this is the core belief of you and I. He says, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. <laughs> that, that place, we get a glimpse of it here, but that place in heaven where there is no more sin and it's one big happy family. <laughs> and we get to be part of that here and now when we ask the Lord, fill me with your spirit. Help me to obey and do things your way. Help me to love those around me. Help me to speak boldly of the name of Jesus. So it's an impossible love. But this is the, what the Holy Spirit did in them. And that's what he's been doing in you and me. Is showing us this new life that we've been designed to live in. So go back to Acts chapter 4. So the first thing was the impossible love. And in verse 33, Acts chapter 4, verse 33, it says, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace or abundant grace was upon them all. So with great power, this message, in their message, as they spoke Jesus, they spoke the resurrection. My question to you is why would they speak the resurrection? They could talk about Jesus' healing. They could talk about Jesus' death. But why was it so important that through the Holy Spirit they spoke with great power of his resurrection? Why is that so important for them and why is that important for us? Why the resurrection? Anybody? Why the resurrection? Yes. <laughs> Who comes back to life? That's right. He came back to life. There's other religious leaders. They're dead, dead. Jesus not only claimed that he would come back to life, he proved it, came back to life. For 40 days, he walked with his believers. 500 people saw it. It's recorded in scripture. It takes faith to believe that, but it's recorded that he came back to life. They were preaching to the religious leaders of the day. Jesus came back to life and we saw him. We witnessed this truth that he came back to life. How, how much higher can you get than that? When you're talking about Jesus, how much higher can you get about speaking about the resurrection, that he came back to life, and that he promised his believers, those that followed him, would have resurrection life also? He's the first fruit of be coming back from the grave. You and I are promised the resurrection life and the resurrection body forever. He commanded blessing on Mount Zion, life forever, forever. You and I are privileged to be a part of that.
by simply believing in Jesus. Life forever. This, this is an amazing thing. I've been um, stopping. Uh, Natalie's been busy at the, during the summer doing camps. And so I've been trying. It's out of my norm, but I've been trying to pick up dinner for her. And so I stopped at the food truck. And so I use those opportunities to talk to people there. We have something in common. It's uh, food. And so we talk about that a little bit. And then I just start asking them, um, so are you from Whatcom County? And that, and that starts another conversation. And then I say, do you believe in Jesus? I... And this gal I was talking to um, this last week, she said, you know, well, I asked her, I said, why don't people believe in Jesus? He said, she said, well, they have a free choice. And I said, do you believe in God created all things and there's a promise of uh, eternal life through Jesus? And she said, it'd be horrible not to believe that there's eternal life. Now, she didn't say through Jesus, but we we're going down that road. So she had some kind of hope of life after this. But it's amazing to think of that promise It's not just something you thought of that was a good thing to think of and it's warm and fuzzy, but it's a truth that through Jesus Christ, there's the promise of eternal life. And speaking of his resurrection, it said with great power, they spoke, they gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And it says great grace was upon them. So the the privilege, what, what what is grace? What? That's unmerited favor. So great grace was upon them. The privilege of God using them as a voice to speak the truth to a world out there. This is Holy Spirit stuff. This isn't something you and I just go to school, go to Bible school and get trained on how to share and then go out in the street and share. This is, this is the Holy Spirit to anyone who believes. Because... It's wanting all Christ, heart. Why did he come? He wanted to save the world. He wants all to come to this big happy family. (laughs) This big happy family. He wants all to rejoice forever and ever in the one who's created and designed them. So you are privileged. So you have that privilege and that responsibility in partaking of this grace. So Ephesians 2, um, 8 So if you know it, maybe you can say it with me. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. It's, it's, It's not, I just figured it out. It's that God has given you, he's graced you this truth. And now you walk in that truth. So recognizing God, his power to witness the resurrection, his, his power or his power, that grace was upon them. Then something amazing happening, and this is my, my last statement. So I did impossible love, impossible message, and now impossible Barnabas. Barnabas. And this Barnabas was like the uh, poster child to this um, social life, shall we say, that was in the kingdom of God, loving one another and sharing with one another. Barnabas was the poster child of the Holy Spirit working in his life. And this is the first mention of Barnabas. And then we find out he was key in Paul's ministry. He's recorded as coming alongside and helping. So watch this, verse 34. So we're in Acts chapter 4, verse 34. Uh, Nor was there any one among them who lacked for all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things which were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each one who had need. Wow. That's just, isn't it just mind-blowing to think? that the disciples weren't keeping a whole bunch to themselves and then giving out. But they were, what they had brought, they were taking and making sure that everyone had what they needed. It's like, wow, that... So, 
Here's, here's the poster child. It says in verse 36. And Joseph, or Jose, who was also named Barnabas, by the apostles, which means, or it's translated, son of encouragement. He got that label. Barnabas got that label. And it says that he was a, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, and having sold land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So for, for some reason, all these people that were doing this, Barnabas was the one that got the, the snapshot in the newspaper. <laughs> there he was. He had, he had the heart. But I want to tell you a little bit about his background. It says that he was a, a Levite from the... Um, from the... Uh, uh, what does it say? A Levite from the country of Cyprus. So a Levite is uh, one of the 12 tribes, is one of, uh, one of the uh, tribes of Israel, and they were the ones that assisted the priest. They assisted the priest. So they made sure that the, the bread in the, in the temple was, was made and ready for the priest to take. They cleaned all the... Uh, the silverware, they cleaned all the utensils. This was the Levites. I think there's some of you in here that clean the silverware. Um, so they made sure the door was open. They made sure the things were clean. That's interesting to me. That he was part of, he came from this family group. That this is what their heritage was, was serving and they served the priest to do the job the priest would do. Now, why that impresses me so much is that if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you're a servant to the Most High God. And the way you serve the Most High God is the way you serve one another. So, there's some among you that could be like Barnabas, could be that poster child of of. That son of encouragement. That, that one that when you're around people, um, they know that they're going to get encouraged by you. They know that you're not one that just talks about stuff and talks stink, but they know that when they're around you, man, they always feel, feel, feel buoyed up. Like, man... The words that they said were just, I don't know. And the way that they, they helped, they were always looking for ways to help. It says Barnabas. They nicknamed him son of encouragement. And I believe the Holy Spirit in us means that all of us have that name. That, that we're looking for, how do I help? How do I encourage? How do I... Because... The way the Lord has blessed you and encouraged you, you're simply sharing that same uh, beautiful thing. So whatever the Lord has done in your life, he has positioned you in people's lives to be that encouragement. You're the one. So I'm excited about this opportunity to uh, help out with with, uh, old settlers, that we're going there to be that encouragement. And my hope is that the church that's praying for us that are there, that the spirit of encouragement of the Holy Spirit in us would be that for people around us. Because there's going to be people asking questions. Where do I go? What do I do? I have a problem here. And it's like, well, let me help you. No, aren't those cool, cool words that you would ever hear that your friend or somebody comes to you and says, how can I help you? Is, is there something I can do to help you? Maybe they've uh, seen it in your eyes and they go, there's something wrong, isn't there? You need, you need something, don't you? Maybe I can help with that. This amazing thing about being a family of God means that the Spirit through us is that encouragement to one another. You know, as times go on, we're going to need one another. When times get really nasty, and they will, according to the scripture, things are going to get bad, 
We're going to need one another to be that anchor and that encouragement. And the only way that you and I can is when we're filled with the Spirit, right? That now we can do that. So we saw this recording. It's just, it's impossible love. Are you kidding? But it's because of believing in Jesus. This impossible message of the resurrection needs to go out to save people's lives forever. And then this impossible Barnabas. You are Barnabas. So welcome to the club. Welcome to the family of Barnabas family. You are sons and daughters of encouragement because of the Holy Spirit in you. And there's people right with you, right around you that need that encouragement. There's people going through tough times. Think about the McKay family. Tough times. They need the word of encouragement. And I know all of you have been already praying for them. Word of encouragement. Penny has surgery coming. She needs encouragement to go through that. So there's people all around you. And you know, the the amazing thing is that even if you've got a hurt, how much more beautiful is it that you've got a hurt, but you're going to help somebody else? That you're going to encourage, even though you've got pain in your own life, God has designed you. So God is always looking for ways to bless you, to show that he's pleased with you. Last week, after they prayed, after they prayed, Lord, make us bold to share your uh, name. Make us bold to share. Um, the whole place shook, and it said that they were filled with the Spirit, and they began sharing uh, with boldness um, Jesus. So I want to share a story with you that happened last week. So I'm going to make a long story long, because I've got about six minutes before my timekeeper. So this was... Uh, uh, Monday Monday afternoon and I was just getting set to come out and help Keith with some of the painting here and I get this call from my son and he says hi dad how are you doing what are you doing and I says well I'm doing good I said I was just getting ready to head out to the church I said how are you doing he said not good that doesn't happen very often I, I usually don't hear that I usually hear doing okay yeah you know whatever but he said, not good. He said, my, uh, my family, they were coming back from the OMAC area and they were coming up the Cascade Highway somewhere over there. Out of cell range, she, she broke down with the car. So I'm over here working all week. She was visiting her mom with the two boys, broke down. So uh, this is a story of God just showing his love for this little family. So they're out of cell range. Uh, Good Samaritan stops by and happened to be a a woman. And she said, what? And so Janine gave uh, Jeremiah her phone number and said, call. Well, she was out of range right then too, right? So she had to get through till she got in so she could call. She calls. So Maya's at work. He receives this call. Jeremiah's three hours away. And it's like, and she, how long had she already been there? I mean, this woman that got the message and then had to call, and so she's already been on. And so, as you could imagine, what is he going to do? How is he going to? Um, so he ends up calling um, Janine's mom, who lives over there, and some of you know Karen. And she's an hour and a half away and said, could you go rescue them? Because we're three hours away. So she gets on her horse car, and she <laughs> she skipped all the roads and went over the no. So she heads out to get them. So there's still no communication. Jeremiah can't talk with her. She can't talk, and she doesn't even know her mom's coming. She doesn't know. She just know, knew that she gave her phone number to the stranger and trusted that the stranger would make the call, make the connection. So things started to happen. My son Jeremiah talks to a guy that has a pickup truck that has a flatbed for a car um, and then also calls his insurance company. Well, they're not going to be able to get to it for a couple hours. So Maya says, well, okay, but I'm heading out. So that's what he shared with me. He said, Dad, would you go with me to pick up the car because I'm hoping that Karen is picking up the kids and we'll go. I said, okay, I'll be ready as soon as you come. So he comes in and pick it up and we start going. 
So we get just past Bow Hill, and the traffic slows right down to a crawl. And it's like, oh, are you kidding? Are you kidding? So five miles of just five miles of this, stop and go, stop and go. Something interesting, God decided to throw uh, comic relief right there at the time. We just go past this one on-ramp, and there's cars coming down, and they notice this. And uh, the last car decides, I can't go this way, and so they start backing up the ramp. And then there was a car over here that saw that, that was in this lane, and went over to the ramp and pulled in and started backing up the ramp. Well, Jeremiah starts laughing, and he says, they're going the wrong way anyways. Why don't they just turn around and drive up to the ramp? (laughs) And so that caused comic relief for us. So God just arranged um, comic relief, and we got through that. And so we're heading on the road. And so what I realized what was happening is that I haven't been able to spend time with my son for three hours, an hour, really. He's a busy man, right? His family's young. But that whole trip, seven hours, I was able to be with my son and we were able to talk about life. So dad and son talking about life. And it was this, it was if um, Jeremiah just laid out all of his cards in a way, just laid them all out and just said, here's all this stuff. And, you know, I'm just, I'm thinking... I want to be the biggest encourager for my boy right now, you know. And so I'm thinking of all the, how could I respond? And, you know, and so we did some praying and as we're going, you know, and just, and he, I really didn't have to say much because he began picking up the answers himself. Always, you know, kind of going, well, I don't need that, but I need this. And, you know, so it was just kind of, it was the coolest thing to be with him and to be part of Barnabas, part of, healing part of and just that time alone God arranged that and I'm feeling it I don't think he feels it quite yet so as we're driving um, we don't know where they are and out of range so we're going up the mountain you know Rockport and and, um, Maple no no, uh, Marble Mount and getting up there and finally this coverage goes away and So there's just this hope that Karen has picked them up and she had told Maya, I'll just bring them to Ferndale. I'll just bring them. And so maybe we'll pass on the road. You know, it's only a two lane and maybe we'll, hey, you know, and good, she's got them. And so that was our hope. And so as we're going up there and we're getting close to, um, what's the, uh, New Halem. And there's a visitor center and Maya says, you want to stop? I said, we better stop. And if we didn't get slowed down by the traffic, we arrived at the exact same time that Karen and the kids and Janine arrived at New Halem. We pulled into the parking lot right there. Now, can I say that God arranged that slow down, God arranged that to tell this family, I love you, I'm taking care of you. And so they jumped out of the car and she's crying and they embraced each other and just everything's going to be okay. And we prayed and everything's going to be okay. And they just, and then Karen went on and drove them home. And is there a God that loves you? There's things that are happening in your life that you can say, I've got a story too. And we don't have time, sorry. (laughs) But, the beautiful thing is Jeremiah has been telling that to everybody at work. God's, God loves me. Look at, he's done these things. And so whenever stuff like that happens, we need to glorify God and tell the world, this happened to my son. This, this happened, this happened, this happened, and you can know them. You and I are meant to be those encouragers, and he has given you stories to encourage others. And the greatest story of all is Christ died for your sins so that you're brought back to God and you're in that family of God and that you and I are meant to help one another to grow and to love the Lord. Yeah. What was the part I missed? 
<laughs> so if you didn't hear that, I sent a message to, Ta- uh, to Keith that I wouldn't be here because I'm going to go save my son's family with him. And he didn't get that. But when he got here, um, Howard and Bradley showed up and took my place. Amen. And it was all God arranged. One more piece of the story it keeps going. Oh, I'm over by three minutes. So anyways, um, the Holy Spirit, these are the signs of the times is the Holy Spirit wants to use you and me. Your nickname from now on is Barnabas. And maybe you've already started to recognize that, that why are people coming to me? It's because you have the spirit of God. You are that one that encourages and you're, you're helping. That's why they're coming to you. That's why. But you're going to see that more and more as the words you speak and the things you do. Help people to find Jesus. He said, I commanded blessing life forevermore the family of God we get a glimpse of that here but ultimately in a few short years really a few short years we'll experience the reality of your faith here so Father in Jesus name we bless your name we thank you that you've arranged that we would be here right now getting through the stuff, praising you and acknowledging the truth that you called us to be a part of your family and to love and care for those around us and those that don't know you, we could show them the door to eternal life through Jesus. So we thank you, Lord God. Lord, would you take our lives this week and would you help us to find ways that we could be Nickname Barnabas. Jesus' name. Amen.